Hey guys. Hi. So, Dr. Marilyn Nall is an audiologist. She's the director of Habilitative Audiology Program at Boston Children's Hospital. She's been working there for 31 years. She's also an assistant professor of um, otology and laryngology at Harvard Medical School. Before coming to Boston, she worked for several years as a pediatric audiologist at the Hearing and Speech Center of Rochester, New York. Um, she grew up in Wisconsin, majored in psychology at Middlebury College in Vermont, and went to grad school in audiology at UMass and Wichita State University. Uh, while in undergrad in psychology, she worked as a lab assistant for a professor who studied auditory electrophysiology in lab rats and learned a great deal about the auditory system. Um, but she had never heard of audiology until after she graduated from Middlebury. Um, since 1995, she has been concentrating on cochlear implant work. She chaired the task force that wrote the newborn hearing screening law in Massachusetts. It's the ninth state to have the mandate and the state with the highest rate of baby screen and followed up. She is the chair of the cochlear implant specialty certification community for the American Board of Audiology. Her research interests lie in cochlear implant outcomes, auditory neuropathy, and progressive hearing loss. She and her husband, Norm, have two daughters, a granddaughter, and a grand dog. Um, and being married to an audiologist, Norm dutifully wears ear protection when mowing the lawn and using power tools. So, welcome, Marilyn. I'm really delighted to be asked here. I came once before, several years ago, and I expected to find a group of groggy, groggy young students on a Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, and I was overwhelmed by how present everybody was and what excellent questions there were and the contributions the group had to make from their own observations. So I see such a group again. Thanks for inviting me. So the cochlear implant. Where do I begin? I have way too many slides because I thought, how can I leave that out? How can I leave that out? This is the only lecture they get on cochlear implants. But of course it isn't if you're going to be uh, studying communication disorders especially. But for physical development majors, I have some information on safety and sports that will be of interest to you also. You know, when Alicia was talking about how I stumbled into this work, I heard a wonderful lecture recently by Dr. Michael Korost. It's spelled, if you ever look for his books, C-H-O-R-O-S-T. He's a bilateral cochlear implant user himself. And Dr. Korost has written two books, Rebuilt and um, The Worldwide Mind, about how technology made him more human instead of less so. But in a recent speech, he was talking about how we choose careers and there were a number of young adults with cochlear implants in the audience. And he gave them advice I thought was wonderful. When you're thinking what to study and heading toward a career, because some of you will end up doing something differently than what you're studying as an undergraduate. Uh, he said, find how you are useful, how you help people solve problems, and how you what you naturally gravitate toward to make yourself useful. And study that. Get really good at that. And don't worry about which job offers the most money or has the most positions open, because if you learn how to make yourself really useful at what you naturally gravitate toward, all those things will take care of themselves. Well, I tripped into audiology entirely by accident. I was cleaning rat cages and putting electrodes in rat brains for a professor at Middlebury College because they didn't have a graduate school in psychology at Middlebury. I was, an un I was lucky enough to be an undergrad research assistant doing things or ordinarily a graduate student would do. But it was a lot of rat cages to clean. They were white. They had red eyes. The babies were little tiny eraser-sized things. And, and um, when I was a senior, I happened to be in the Middlebury College Library and picked up an issue of Science Magazine uh, and read the original article about how you could record a change in brain waves in response to sound from the scalp of humans. I went screaming across campus, Dr. Crowley, Dr. Crowley, you can do this in people. Uh, and it was the beginning of the development of the test that babies get to find out if they have a hearing loss and how much. And I still hadn't heard of audiology, 
but one summer took a speech course and then tripped into it accidentally. Most people who find audiology, the first audiology lecture they have, they know. They know that's them. Okay. Cochlear implants. When I think back to what what we did with hearing aids for children who are profoundly deaf. Hearing aids for children who are profoundly deaf don't usually do enough for them. And yet they have to spend a great deal of their time on them. They have to have ear molds remade and remade. That they're constantly told to, to put their ear mold in better because the, there's feedback and they squeal and they work very hard at speech therapy and um, still don't develop speech that's easy for their friends to understand. Um, and everything has changed with oral deaf education with the introduction of the cochlear implant. It's man's first artificial sense organ and it truly is an artificial sense organ. It takes aspects of things that happen in the environment and translates them into changes in neural activity in the brain, and if that isn't an artificial sense organ, I don't know what is. So a cochlear implant, as you probably know, has two parts. One part's implanted, and then um, after that's implanted in the ear and the incision heals up, somewhere from one to four weeks later, uh, the individual starts wearing the externally worn processor, which looks like a big hearing aid with the thing coming out the back. And then they begin to hear. Now, um, what, you know, we'll concentrate mainly on children today. Of course, there's a parent's best fear and a parent's worst nightmare. After the implant is uh, activated, which involves programming the processor and then um, act, turning on a microphone so that the child can hear sounds that are happening in the room, after it's all over, I sometimes ask the parent, <coughs> did you have a worst fear? What was your worst fear about today? And they often say that their worst fear was not that the child would cry, but that theirs would be the one in a gazillion who wouldn't hear anything with it. And we would know beforehand if that were likely to be the case, because either the child has a cochlea to put the implant in, but no auditory nerve to carry the signals to the brain, which if that isn't known beforehand, the implant team didn't do its job, um, or the implant wasn't in the cochlea at all, um, and the surgeon thought they were putting it in the cochlea and they were just feeding it into a little hole in the mastoid bone. But these things should be known before the activation. So this is what we try to avoid. The processor's on her head. They've turned on the microphone. They're starting to turn up. Is she going to hear out of that ear right away? Mm -hmm. Bop, 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 bop. Of course, the parent could rationalize. She cried, so she must have heard. It just scared her. But it's not necessary to. Here we go. It's coming back on. It's in here. He's back on again. It's the other turn. Hi, Jonathan. Baby would have 
looked happy no matter what that voice sounded like. Now, what does it actually sound like? My first introduction to somebody who actually had a cochlear implant was in about 1992. Um, the cochlear implant was approved by the FDA for children in 1990, for children beginning at age 24 months. And a year or two later, the manufacturer um, held a little symposium at what was then called Boston School for the Deaf, which was not in Boston, it was in Randolph. And um, they brought in two children with cochlear implants, uh, one of whom lost his hearing to meningitis at age six and went to New York and got an implant and um, one of whom also got an implant in New York and was from upstate New York, but they, the manufacturer brought her in to familiarize the clinicians and educators of Boston with children who have cochlear implants. And the strangest thing happened. Now, i had been working as an audiologist for years, and I knew a cochlear implant wouldn't be a cure. It couldn't produce perfect hearing. And yet when I saw the two children uh, who were school-age children uh, who functioned as a little panel and answered questions. But when I saw them signing to each other, I thought, I guess they don't really work. How naive and ridiculous. That's as naive as when I used to thought, think that um, blind was either seeing or completely dark with no shades of gray in between. And um, and of course, neither is the case. And the cochlear implant gives partial hearing. And that can be very, very, very good. On the other hand, it takes someone who is pretty deaf and doesn't use their hearing for functional purposes and needs to be a visual person. It's very, very clear that the person without a cochlear implant who's you know deaf enough for one in those days um, would have to rely on vision for communication entirely. And it takes that person and gives them all the problems of being hard of hearing, all the ambiguities, all the situations where someone says, well, when I was talking to him one to one, yesterday he understood every word I said, so he must be understanding me back there in the seventh row with the student next to him flipping his pencil on the desk. And um, sometimes being partially hearing is more challenging than being non-hearing because it's hard to get other people to understand what is helpful to you in order to receive communication clearly. So it takes a village. <laughs> to do well for your patients with a cochlear implant. Not everybody needs everybody on the team. Um, an adult team typically is just a surgeon and an audiologist and some counselor, a social worker or a psychologist who meets with the adult usually once to make sure they want the cochlear implant for the right reason um, and that they will have a communication partner to help them as they're learning to use it and that they will have support through the surgical procedure and recovery. Um, but we've grown, grown from uh, one surgeon and one audiologist and a couple of psychologists and a speech pathologist doing the work to this whole crew here. And um, when we meet every other week to go over cases and um, protocols, it's a very long conference table. So I gave a lecture at Boston University which has a program uh, to teach um, deaf educators uh, for students who are, are going to be visual in their communication and it has a sign language emphasis. And I was asked to go give a lecture on cochlear implants. And I knew that there would be students in the class who wouldn't feel um, 
very happy about the topic. So I thought, let's get it out on the table. So I put this slide up first, and I said, this is a 12-month-old child. You can see his hair hasn't quite grown back from the surgery, and he's wearing his cochlear implant processor. How does this picture make you feel? And a deaf student in the class who's going to be a teacher of the deaf um, signed wildly that she was going to throw up and she had to leave and she wouldn't be able to stay for the rest of the class because it was so upsetting for her. So although that attitude has become less frequent and there's no such thing as the deaf community speaking with one voice on the topic, there are still people who feel that being deaf um, is a difference, um, not a disability, and that uh, it, there's no necessity to change it because nothing's missing. It's just a different way to live. And I think it's wonderful that the human race can arrive at that method of living without hearing. I think that parents who opt for a cochlear implant for their child should know enough about that viewpoint to understand why somebody might feel that way, which means actual communication between people with differing opinions, which actually can bring governments back into operation. So that is the speech of someone who is, is profoundly deaf, who learned to speak using hearing aids that gave them a drop of distorted sound and lots and lots of speech therapy. Um, we don't hear this in children very often anymore. But without adequate communication skills, if a, if a child's hearing loss isn't diagnosed until they're two or three and the critical period for language development is already passed, there's no true catch up. And some adults who did not get all the breaks and did not get access to a language, whatever language, early, um, now, this survey is, is quite old, and it would be interesting if it were done again. But on a survey in California of clients with different types of disabilities, it was the deaf who had the lowest education level, income, lowest percentage working, lowest percentage in professional and technical jobs. Yes, there are, are and were 20 years ago PhDs who use sign language to communicate. Um, but there are many more, and you'll meet deaf adults today who are um, underemployed um, for their native abilities. But with newborn hearing screening, the bottom two bars shows that now that new we have newborn hearing screening, hearing loss is diagnosed usually by three months of age, which gives a chance to introduce a language, any language that the child has access to in time for normal brain development. Um, so newborn screening and cochlear implant outcomes are tied together. There's no doubt about it, because if without newborn hearing screening, the average age of diagnosis of hearing loss is one to two and a half years, um, more like one for a bilateral profound loss, more like two and a half for anything better than that. Um, so the idea, of course, is find them early, find any other problems. 40% of deaf and hard of hearing kids have another challenge. Help parents learn and experience their options. Introduce language right away. Offer a cochlear implant, the lowest FDA-approved age approved age is 12 months, but um, just as with any medical intervention, once it's FDA approved, 
the physician if he or she deems that the intervention is medically necessary can offer it um, for a different condition or at a younger age. Um, and if you put in a cochlear implant and do nothing, of course, what you get is nothing. Before we started doing cochlear implants at Boston Children's, one day a family came from one of the Middle Eastern countries and showed up in the otolaryngology clinic and was seen by a resident. And of course, we see many international patients. It's not unusual. So they had an Arabic interpreter. And the father said to the resident, my four-year-old son here had surgery a year ago to improve his hearing. He's deaf. But it's been a year, and his hearing doesn't seem to be any better. <coughs> so we came here. So the resident was scratching his head and sent the boy around to audiology. And um, one of our newer audiologists got the child in the, in the booth and did an audiogram. And the child had a profound hearing loss in both ears. And she brought the clipboard down the hall to me and said, what kind of operation did he have? Um, I don't get it. His eardrums are perfectly normal. I said, feel behind each ear and see if there's a bump behind his ear as though there's a nickel or a quarter under his skin on one side. And she started to realize what I was getting at. And um, she did so, and she came back, and she said, uh-huh. And I said, OK, now go take the child back to the father and the physician and, and ask if when they had the surgery, were they given a box? And the father said, yes. We brought it with us. It's in the hotel room. We never opened it because nobody ever told us what to do with it. Now, this was in the early 90s, but a cochlear implant had been inserted, and nobody ever told the family the child actually had to wear a processor on the outside for it to work. So a wasted year in the child's life. An absurd story, but it goes to show that if you put it in and do nothing, you get nothing. But if everything is set up well, you can help the child reach their full potential. So what the heck does that mean? Using language up to their cognitive potential. Um, most kids now with cochlear implants are entering mainstream by kindergarten level. Um, we want them reading and learning at grade level. We want them to have successful, true friendships. We want them to be able to converse with anyone without an intermediary in every conversation. We want them to be able to use the phone, enjoy music, and become, not my term, but a common one, a literate taxpayer, eventually. Can they do all that without hearing, with sign language? Of course they can. Um, except for conversing with anyone without an intermediary, because this is not Martha's Vineyard in the 1800s, and everyone here does not speak sign language. If you don't know that story, read Everyone Here Spoke Sign Language. Great book. Um, but why can't ASL users often accomplish this? Because 95% of deaf children are born to hearing parents who have to quick learn ASL before they can use it fully with their child. They learn along with their child, but the child is not immersed in a competent language environment in a language that they have full access to immediately. So cultural issues play in greatly in the cochlear implant world. Um, and not just deaf culture, but uh, people coming from within our country from other cultures and people coming from other countries, moving here or visiting. And um, it has been, uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but it has been particularly <coughs> fascinating for me to learn from these families from Nepal. Somalia, 
Afghanistan, etc. What does it mean in their country to be deaf? What would a cochlear implant mean to them? And in many, and I have a little document called The Values Americans Live By that we used to have to read at Children's Hospital before we went into the patient education section of our internal website. And um, it, it's a very, very, been a very valuable document to me. The idea is you have to understand your own values before you can understand the values of the family or child you're working with. And in many cultures, um, if a child is born with a difference, it was fate, God made it that way, and it would be wrong to change it. We in this country tend to um, emphasize the rights of the individual. If there's a problem, we change it. In some cultures, the approach to medical care is very different. Um, they aren't expecting choices. They may expect you to tell them what to do and along with that, the exact percentage that it will work with their child. Oh, no shades of gray. We like to know our choices, usually, and participate in the decision what to do, and can understand that there's some ambiguity in the potential result of the intervention, depending what happens along the way. So let's turn to the cochlear implant. It's just a tool, but it seems like a miracle. But it's a miracle that you make. The child makes it, the family makes it. Really, it's the little brain that makes it. Because the signal that it really gives to the ear, which feeds it onto the brain, is paltry and sparse and rough compared to normal hearing. And what the little brain does with it is astonishing. So it's an implantable biomedical device. It's approved and controlled by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, it gives access to sound by stimulating the, actually the cell bodies of the auditory nerves. Um, and it does so by bypassing the non-working parts of the inner ear. So it consists, of course, of an internal part, the implant, which is on the upper right there, and then the processor, which is worn on the ear like a hearing aid. Coming from the processor is a cable leading to a transmitting coil. And in the middle of that transmitting coil is a magnet. Now, the magnet has nothing to do with the sound transmission. It's just to hold the transmitting coil on the head, because under the skin, there's also a magnet. Um, it's at the center of the upper part of the implant. So you have two magnets and skin between. And that's just a clever way to hold it on. If somebody needs MRIs repetitively and they can't have a magnet, because if they did, when the MRI machine were turned on, it would go whack, you know, your head, not the machine, your head would go whacking against the machine. Um, it is possible to have an, either have the magnet removed uh, or to have a magnet put in with uh, an implant put in with no magnet in the first place, and then it's held on by a sticky disc on the outside. Did I see a question? I saw a stretch. That's good, too. <coughs> so brief history. The part about Volta really has nothing to do with implants, except it shows that electrical stimulation creates uh, sensation of sound. Supposedly, Volta himself, after whom volts are named, stuck rods in his ears, connected them to a 50-volt battery, and heard a boom, followed by a boiling of thick soup, which I suspect he heard for the rest of his life, but I don't know. <laughs> um, but at any rate, the modern history of implants uh, actually started in the 60s with research on a single channel implant that was actually offered to some individuals by 1972. Now, what would a single channel implant do? It would give you the same buzz no matter what sound was coming in. So how are you would sound like buzz, buzz, buzz. But each buzz would be the same length as the word, and there would be a slight variation in loudness so you add that to lip reading, 
And for someone who had hearing and lost it, a single channel implant was actually beneficial. The person would read lips and get the sound pattern along with it. Um, so in 1985, a multi-channel implant was approved for adults and by 1990 for children. Now, has anyone here ever heard of an award called the Lasker Award, L-A-S-K-E-R? Okay, I hadn't either. The Lasker Award is the American version of the Nobel Prize. And whoever wins the Lasker Award very often, a couple years later, wins the Nobel Prize for the same accomplishment. This year, three people who played the most basic, primary, important roles in the development of the cochlear implant won the Lasker Award. So, I'm so hoping that in a couple years they actually win the Nobel Prize because that definitely hits the news and more people will know about cochlear implants. There were a couple of um, funny, not so funny, clips made, one in Australia where the largest manufacturer of cochlear implants happens to be, and one on the streets of Cambridge where some smart people happen to go to school, almost as smart as those who go to Bridgewater State. And um, it was a man on the street thing with the microphone. What is a cochlear implant? You're these Harvard and MIT students. I don't know. Well, if you had one, where in your body would it go? I don't know. Your groin? Uh, and so forth. And the same thing in Sydney, Australia, where they're made. It was unbelievable. You know, 20 people in a row not knowing what a cochlear implant is. I think they're everywhere. I sat down on an airplane coming home from a vacation and there was an empty seat beside me and a girl sat down in it and her mother was across the aisle. And I was stuffing my backpack under the chair in front of me. My husband, I feel his elbow in my ribs. She's got a cochlear implant right next to me on an airplane. Okay, so how does it work? So the processor has a microphone. What do microphones do? They change sound to electricity. Then inside the processor, that sound is coded into something called a map. And map, even though it's often capitalized, like I'm going for a map, it doesn't stand for anything. It's just map. Um, so the signal is coded into something that will be presented to the electrodes. I'll explain in a moment. And the signal is sent across the skin from that transmitting coil across the skin to the receiver stimulator under the skin by FM radio waves. And there's a computer chip in that receiver stimulator, which is under the skin behind the ear here, which sends signals to the electrodes in the cochlea, which in turn stimulate the auditory nerves to fire. And the brain somehow learns to interpret this as meaningful sound. OK, so in the normal ear, you have 20,000 hair cells laid out on a piano keyboard sort of thing that's rolled up two and a half times. So 20,000 hair cells. You can discriminate hundreds of pitches. You can appreciate differences in loudness from zero decibels to 120 decibels. And you can localize where sounds are coming from if you have two good ears. OK, with one cochlear implant, you have, at most, 22 active electrodes trying to do the job of 20,000 hair cells. You can appreciate loudness variations not from 0 to 120 decibels, from about 25 to 70 decibels, usually. And you, it, when with one cochlear implant, you have no ability to localize sound sources. And even with two, the ability is um, reduced. And yet, 
um, um, you can easily have a conversation with most people with cochlear implants, and most can use the phone. So there's the world's first processor. Put that on your ear. And here is the first one that could be carried around. The processor is in that briefcase-like thing. That's Rod Saunders' wife talking to him through the microphone of his processor. And he is absolutely delighted. Rod Saunders was the first gentleman in Australia to get a commercially available cochlear implant. There was somebody who got one experimentally before that. So that was a portable sound processor. Next came the wearable sound processor, which was a big calculator size thing. And now, um, well, those are implants. And now the processors have gotten smaller and smaller to the point that some of them are the size of a hearing aid and look indistinguishable from a hearing aid except for the transmitting coil. And one is actually built into the place where the transmitting coil goes. So it's like a large coil on the side of the head. No wire, nothing on the ear. And people still complain they're big. Doing what that room full of equipment did. So the cochlea is laid out so that it's just begging for an implant. Why did ear implants come before eye implants? Because the retina is not, not so easy as the cochlea. The cochlea is just made for it. Um, inside the cochlea, which is, you know, the inner ear has two parts, the hearing part and the balance part. And the hearing part is the cochlea. It's the size of a pencil eraser or a pea. It's like a little bony snail. It's very white bone. And it's deep inside, all the way in where you hear the bass or low notes, and toward the outside where you hear the high frequency. So it's like a piano keyboard rolled up starting at the bottom. So when the electrode array is fed in there, it's not 16 or 22 separate wires. It's one long array with contacts along it. Um, but it doesn't go all the way in. It just goes once around where we hear higher frequencies. So the whole thing sounds high. And you may meet um, people with cochlear implants whose voice is a little higher and harsher than you would expect. And it's because that's um, how they're hearing. Not all, but some um, are like that. So the microphone feeds the sound to the processor, and the processor has filter banks, the same number of filter banks as it has electrodes that it's going to feed the sound to. So they're like baskets. So the processor's listening. Is there some energy in where, in where this basket is? Yes. OK, it's an, it's an ooh, it's low frequency energy. We're going to put it down in the, in the bottom two bins. So if you stimulate those two electrodes, it sounds like an ooh, just because of where they are in the cochlea, not because of the pulse you're feeding to them. And an, a s, an S sound would be at the other end. So every sound has its own footprint. And um, thousands of times every second, it gives new updates as to, like a flip book, as to the sound that's coming in. OK, now, what does it sound like? We don't know. What would it sound like if you hooked your hair cells up to loudspeakers and played it? It might sound horrible. But this is a scientific best guess by some very smart people um, as to what it would sound like. Now, I'm going to play it from one channel, then two, then four, eight, and 16, and then the original. And I want you to notice that when you don't know what, it's the same thing being said each time. When you don't know what's being said, you need more detail in the sound. When you do know already what's being said, you can get by with less detail. So if you already know how the language works, 
you can hear it in a reduced form. If you don't know how the language works, you need a more complete signal. And that has huge implications for language learning. So this is what a single channel implant would sound like. I'm going to play it again. Okay, let's try two. Anybody got it yet? Oops. I like to play tennis. What do you think it says? It does. It does. Now let me play that again now, knowing that it says I like to play tennis. Now it's obvious. I like to play tennis. 16. Now that is probably a pretty reasonable representation of what many people with cochlear implants actually do here. I like to play tennis. You can make out the words. It sounds like a robot with a sore throat. But you can make out the words. Now, would our hair cells sound like a robot with a sore throat hooked up to loudspeakers? Probably. This is minus all that the brain does above the level of the auditory nerve to modulate the signal. And now let's... I like to play tennis. How rich and redundant and beautiful that is. How overloaded it is. We could cut that down so many ways and still understand it. Okay, there are three manufacturers of cochlear implants. Oh my gosh, the hour is almost over. We have until 9.15. Oh, we do. we do? I do want to leave a little time for questions, though, so start thinking of your questions. Um, I think I should jump to... Some of you may not have ever met a young child with a cochlear implant, right? Maybe? I should probably jump to a couple of clips in case you... Oh, I just... Oh, I don't know if you've ever heard a lecture by a technology futurist, but they are scary. You know, those things like be ready to jump because the changes you think are happening in three years are going to be here in three weeks. You know, like audiologists are reeling at the fact that there's a hearing aid that you can reprogram with your iPhone now. This has implications for the entire um, profession as to, um, wait a minute, we used to bill for that. You know, and that's just one change. But here what I'm showing is that um, if you have somebody with a severe high frequency hearing loss, and say there's a moderate hearing loss for the bass tones, and that region benefits from a hearing aid. All they need is a boost. But in the high frequencies, there's no hearing at all, so a hearing aid doesn't help there. So you slip a short cochlear implant part way into the cochlea so that you can hear the high frequencies with that, and you still use a hearing aid in the same ear for the low frequencies. So over on the right there, you see a processor with electricity generating power from the transmitting coil to go to the implant that's going to stimulate the high frequencies. And look at the ear hook in the front. It has an ear mold on it. It's going to have amplified sound coming out of the same instrument to stimulate the low frequencies. And then you can have wire, a wireless microphone transmitting to that. So within professions, we develop all these specialties. And in audiology, we have three toolboxes and three sets of specialists, cochlear implant audiologists, hearing aid specialists, 
And then the wireless people, the people who know the most are the educational audiologists because they deal with FM systems where the teacher wears a microphone and transmits the voice to the student's receiver. Well, now you might need all three of those in the same ear. I can program a cochlear implant. Great, I know every model, I know the software. I haven't been able to keep up on hearing aid programming. I've got to go back and, and um, master it again. Um, and again, this has implications for training and um, clinical practice at many levels. Fascinating. Okay. Um, as I get to the clips here, you used to have to be stone deaf, which is not a politically incorrect term, I hope. Stones do not hear. In order to get a cochlear implant, like no benefit from a hearing aid. Now that's not the case. You can have some residual hearing and get implanted in one or both ears if the cochlear implant is likely to provide better um, access to sound than the hearing aids. Okay. Here is, um, I switched these two by accident, so I know this one comes first. A little girl who was implanted at 16 months. Would you like to do a moon or an ice cream cone? Boom. I want the moon. Uh, well, the moon is okay. So she's early in the process. She's Push. had her processor turned on for seven months. Wiggle. She's using both sign language and up. speech. Pick it up and show mommy. Children with cochlear implants are so used to listening to exactly what they hear, I think they should be introduced to a second language as soon as they've got the first one pretty well under their belt because they're very good at being bilingual in spoken languages if they got an early start. Let's do one more. Let's do this one to make a point. We met this little girl. Oh no, this is a short one. This is during the programming of the implant, during mapping. They first hear beeps through a computer that comes through a wire before the microphone is activated and they hear the sounds in the room. And this was a 24 month old's very first response to sound. Oh, yeah. I just saw her the other day. She's 14. I think I can make some new clips here. But they're, they're the same. They're, they don't, nothing's changed there. Okay, this is what I want to show you to make a point. Some people feel pretty strongly that if you're going to get a cochlear implant, you shouldn't sign, that the point of it is to listen and speak. But if you can't get one until 12 months and you know about the hearing loss by three months, and it's, the hearing loss is severe enough that you're not going to be acquiring spoken language on a normal timetable. What are you doing for nine months? So this little girl was diagnosed actually at 12 months before newborn hearing screening. And um, when we met her at 24 months, she was quite fluent in ASL. The family had a deaf mentor. They got a deaf babysitter. They had a sign language teacher come to the house. Some neighbors and relatives joined in. Anyway, she was fluent in ASL by 24 months when she got her implant. And here she is 26 months later. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, 
indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So the point is a language that the child has access to if there's going to be a period of time uh, before auditory access. Um, I could go on all day or all semester, but you'd be, uh, that wouldn't do. So what questions do you have, big or small? Yes. Does radio transmission or like cell phone transmission interfere with the cochlear implant? That's a good question. Does uh, cell phone transmission interfere with your implant? It does not, but sometimes the, the implant interferes with the cell phone signal. <laughs> Not usually, though. And um, the newest processors uh, are going to be having um, Bluetooth, so you can do FaceTime and hear at the same time with no wire between. Um, meanwhile, there are also wires you can plug from a cell phone into a processor or um, turn on a telecoil, an induction coil, like on a hearing aid and either put the phone up to the ear or have the phone down here and put a silhouette inductor sort of thing next to it. Like, like in Logan Airport, certain uh, areas are looped so that if you turn on the, uh, your hearing aid to the T-switch, you can hear the announcements. Same thing, only ear level. Yes? Are they waterproof? Are they waterproof? Um, there is one model uh, that is actually swimmable without putting it in a plastic bag. Others, if they use a rechargeable battery, and I say that because the disposable batteries need an air supply or they go dead, um, but others you can put in um, an airtight plastic bag, uh, either custom made for that model or an, a lock sack like um, kayakers use to put their cell phone in. Um, Turn it on, put the whole processor in there, put it on, put a swim cap over it. Sounds a bit muffled, but what really do you hear in the pool? Yeah? So, I guess <coughs> uh, the thing I'm most interested in is like the kind of rejection by the deaf community and what like factors like parents would have into choosing between a cochlear implant and like entering you know, fully into that deaf community. And like, what is your experience with kind of talking through parents for that choice? Oh, it's an endlessly rich and interesting topic that at least people are able to talk about now, mostly without, you know, getting all upset about it. And I, um, there certainly are people who are born deaf, who use ASL as their language, who do not feel something missing. And if they have children, who are also deaf, they do not feel their children are missing anything. And actually their children are immersed in a language accessible to them from the get-go. So from that standpoint, they're um, well off. That being said, there are some signing deaf couples bringing their deaf children to implant centers to be implanted. They sign at home with their parents, and they go to school and learn to listen and speak. Um, often when that's the case, at least one of the parents had some oral deaf education and remembered what a struggle it was with hearing aids. I don't know if you've seen Sound and Fury, but there's Sound and Fury six years later. Have you seen the movie Sound and Fury? It was an um, Oscar-nominated documentary several years ago. And I don't know if the whole thing's on YouTube now or not, but there's Sound and Fury six years later where the little girl who wanted an implant and her signing deaf family said no, finally got one. And she's in college now, and uh, she comes every year to a, every other year to a biennial convention we have in the area. In terms of that one case, this, this young lady who had one put in, how was she received or... or yeah, how is she, might she be received by the uh, deaf community? Oh, the girl in Sound and Fury? Yep. Well, it's very public, so I'll use her name. It's Heather Artinian. And in Sound and, and Fury, um, there are two brothers, a deaf brother and a hearing brother. The deaf brother marries a deaf woman, and they have three deaf children. 
one of whom is Heather. So they're all deaf. The hearing brother has a hearing wife and twin boys, one of whom is deaf. Um, the hearing brothers, the hearing brother gets a cochlear implant for his son, the twin who's deaf, which causes a huge rift in the family. Um, but then Heather, at age five, who wears hearing aids, which are not really frowned upon by many members of the deaf, uh, signing deaf community, um, because you can take them off. They don't cause a difference in your body. Um, Heather wants to talk directly to the neighbor kids, and she decides she wants a cochlear implant. And she um, researches it at the five-year-old level. And um, you can see if you've had a lot of experience with cochlear implants that she's actually a good candidate because she is what's called a driven communicator. She'll do anything to get her point across. And that's always a good factor for, well, any intervention in communication really is more likely to succeed with a driven communicator. So she um, finally got one when she was about 11. And so did her siblings and so did her mother. The father came to peace with it after all those years because he saw that it did not change their communication mode in the family. He was afraid it would break the family apart by breaking their closeness. But it didn't. So he was okay with it. It wasn't for him. You know, he didn't want it. But, um, yeah, so there is sound of hearing six years later. Yes? What's the main difference between what a person can hear with a hearing aid and what they can hear with a cochlear implant? What's the difference between hearing with a hearing aid and with a cochlear implant? That will depend on your degree of hearing loss. If you have a moderate degree of hearing loss and it's purely um, caused by structures in the cochlea that have been affected so that the auditory nerve itself is pretty normal, then um, a hearing aid will provide uh, fairly clear sound and probably better intonational information, um, better perception of music than a cochlear implant. A cochlear implant, if it's a more severe loss, the cochlear implant will allow you to hear softer sounds than a hearing aid will. Um, and a little broader frequency range. Um, but the sound through the cochlear implant is not as natural um, as it is through the hearing aid. But if you can't hear anything through the hearing aid, then, uh, then the cochlear implant is uh, far superior. Whether, if you have an auditory memory of natural sound, the cochlear implant sound is very weird at first and starts to sound normal fairly soon. The way children get, uh, the way children figure it out, if they've never heard anything and you turn on an implant, the way they figure it out is by making sounds themselves. I bang on this drum, it makes this sensation, I stop, it stops. Otherwise, how would they know that sound is caused by something external to their body if they've never experienced it? It's just a sensation in their head. Yes? Uh -oh. Are there kind of uh, applications for cochlear implants for degenerative hearing loss? Or, yeah, because I, I think that was on the paper that you read about you that you were studying. Yes, the question is are there applications of cochlear implants for degenerative loss? In fact, those were the people who, were, who got them first. People who once had normal hearing and then as adults they lost their hearing for one reason or another. They already understood the sound content of the language and could learn to make sense of sound relatively quickly. There are many children with progressive degenerative hearing loss who get cochlear implants. It's not all children born deaf. Many, many are older. Yes? Those that received the, um, the uh, cochlear implant after becoming deaf at a later stage, do they have trouble with the speech as well? or? Are they still able to communicate practically as I, clearly as they used to? If you lose your hearing later, how does it affect your speech? There's kind of what I call the magic third birthday rule. We don't see much meningitis anymore um, because of immunizations. Thank heavens. But 
we used to see several new de deaf children every winter due to meningitis. And if they had the meningitis and lost their hearing, I swear, at two years, 11 months, they would stop talking and have to start over when they got access to sound. And if they lost it at three years, one month, I swear, they would keep on talking. And nobody can prove me wrong anymore because there isn't any meningitis. Well, there is. Kids who either haven't had the immunizations yet or that small percentage where you get meningitis anyway. Meningitis doesn't always cause deafness, but pneumococcal meningitis, when it does cause deafness, it wipes your hearing out. Totally. Yes? We generally uh, insert one cochlear implant. We never do two ears. Ah, and well, the reason why I'm asking that is that if you were to do two ears, would that help better to locate the sound or not? Well, when hearing aids were invented, people got one, and then they started getting two. What do you know? Just like shoes or gloves or any glasses. We wear one lens on our glasses. So when cochlear implants were first put in, it was almost always one. The first person to get two was probably a deafblind, somebody losing their vision who was going to really need to localize. Now it's typical to get two. And in fact, um, Many children, probably probably most, either get um, sequential bilateral implants, they get one and then the other in another surgery. Or if they have a little hearing in the other ear, they might get an implant in one ear and a hearing aid in the other. That would be a bimodal rather than bilateral user. Or two at once. Um, <clears throat> and we're doing many simultaneous bilateral implants now at 10 months. We're going to have to turn it over to Alicia at this moment. Okay. Okay. Well, we just want to say thank you for coming. We'd like to get this shirt. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming.